my wife and I were laughing yesterday because we had gone out and had to buy dirt. <laughs> Can you imagine that, having to buy dirt? I almost wanted to go out to a field and just dig a hole and bring it home. <laughs> Sometimes I think it would be better. But we had these containers that we've been filling with dirt and planting cantaloupe and watermelon and corn and carrots and peas and squash and spinach and all kinds of things, you know. And it's all growing and it's kind of neat, you know, and also flowers, you know, got lots of little flowers going. In. The seedlings, which is interesting, is that we have so many of them that if they do all grow, then we'll have to get more dirt. <laughs> but planting them and then setting them up and getting them where they can get sunshine each day and, you know, enough water that we water them every day. And it's kind of interesting to see how they grow and how much that God does for us that we don't appreciate as much maybe as we possibly could. For instance, like when you go to the grocery store, you automatically just buy things without ever thinking about where they came from. You know that, like hamburger meat or, you know, steak or yogurt or milk. You know, we don't actually have a hands-on effect with our food that we consume unless you're growing your own garden. And you know, I think that's kind of a good lesson to learn, maybe a part of being in a technology society, we need to also recognize that we should be partially agrarian, meaning we should have a little bit of hands-on contact with the things that we eat and the things that we do. You know, kind of like practicing what you preach, you know, like in religion, or you know, having a hands-on effect when you deal with tithing, you know, or when you're giving offerings for the poor, have a hands-on effect, you know, where you directly see what's going on with it. Because I know even in evangelism, a lot of times people give money to go have someone else do what it is they won't do themselves. And I'm not against that, but I'm also for the whole reality of if Jesus was face-to-face, one-on-one, then maybe there's a point to us being personal one-to-one. -one. Maybe there's a reason why evangelism isn't about thousands coming to Jesus, but it's about one-to-one -one person meeting and sharing and relating on a personal level the intimacy of God. Maybe that's why you see so many people that don't hear Jesus speak, that don't know that God can talk to them directly one-on-one. -on -one. And I kind of think that's a shame because I know for myself, you know, a lot of people miss out on growing plants, you know, seeing just how big a squash plant can get. It's amazing to me. <laughs> you should see it. It's right over here. <laughs> oh, man, it's huge. I started off with a little tiny squash and it's like, it was all oh, about this big. And now it's like this big and this tall and it's all over the place and it's just getting bigger. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh. Same thing with my little tomato plants. They started off, you can see back there, as little things, and now they're trees. And they're getting these big tomatoes. They're still green, but they're growing. And I think that when we lose sight of that personal contact, when we don't make that connection directly, personally, then we kind of lose sight of who God is sometimes. That if we're not personal with our God, I wonder if we're personal with each other. You know, if we're not talking to each other, like maybe, you know, even in digital, you know, getting a camera or getting a kind of a connective way of connecting with each other, you know, like video chat or something. If we don't make that personal contact, I know for myself, people read my words and sometimes they go, well, he's also, you know, like prideful or some arrogant kind of, you know, like egotist and... Then they watch my videos, they go, that ain't no egotist. <laughs> That's a wacko. <laughs> and I try to tell people, look, if you don't understand the words, watch the video. <laughs> it's going to make more sense after you see a video or two. Then go back and read my words. Then you'll understand. Because, yes, I have an intellect. Yes, I have intelligence. Yes, I have, you know, a wealth of knowledge. But my experience with God personally is what I relate to individually with whatever the circumstances are that come to me 
corporately, you know, from the world, and then I apply it to the individual circumstances of those that are reading, so that way maybe they get touched by God in some way. And so I wonder if we don't sometimes lose touch with the reality of who God is because we're not being that face-to-face, one-on-one person that Jesus wants us to be. You know, how hard is it, really, if we just lowered our standards? I mean, you know, standards of not living and you know ethics and morals and everything, but lowered our standards of this idea of thousands coming to Jesus and maybe caring about one person walking with God the rest of their life. What if we chose to make quality the issue and not quantity? Because, see, in America, there's this idea that quantity will produce quality. I mean, that's why we have mega churches, we have mega evangelism, we have mega this and mega that, and we even have mega folks because we can't talk personally to each other anymore. You know, we don't know how to communicate. Maybe if we started working on the quality and not the quantity, we would spend time with each other for the rest of our life. Like, you know, seeing something grow up from the beginning all the way to complete fruition. I think Jesus did that with his disciples. What if we decided in our life to do like Jesus did? Any person that you share with, you spend three years with. You know, make a commitment, a three-year commitment to spend time with them. I know for most of you, you know, a three-year commitment is kind of like marriage. That's about as long as they last. You know, three years and then they get a new one. But maybe the church as a whole could take this idea of three and a half years or three years and run with it. You know, say, look, we're not letting go and we're not letting you go until three years are up. Give us three years of your life and we'll make you into a man or a woman of God. Give us three years to disciple together, to learn to grow, to be one another as we should be one in the spirit of one and the Lord, as we should be loving one another. Because you see, I think in three years, you'd have plenty of time to see weeds grow up, plenty of time to see weird fruit grow up, plenty of time to prune some, to clip some, you know, to kind of get everything organized the right way. And then by the time three years are up, they're already on their way. You know, I think that's something that we need to think about, you know, when we deal with evangelism and discipleship, you know, this three-year commitment thing that Jesus did with his disciples. Because after all, the Lord was only here for three years, and look what he did with the world. Completely changed it. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. God has called us to peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceful habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Whoso hearken unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Great peace have they which love thy law. You know, I think about that, and that's what God has brought me to. You know, a real place of peace and comfort, of knowing him so I don't have to fear what the world may do or what circumstances may come at me. I know in a crisis, you know, oftentimes I'm put in a position where I respond as the Christian on the spot. That's the way we should be that pillar in God's temple, that solid foundation in the world that seems to be changing all the time. We should have some rock bedwork that we could say, well, we know Michael believes. He always says this. And 
every situation. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not in thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, he'll direct your path. There should be some core values that we hold to, and that people will know us by our love, but also by our word, and also by the fact that we live what we believe. Because I think if we spent that time, you know, three years getting to know each other, then there wouldn't be a misunderstanding in the future if something happened to us. You know, like we fell down, or we tripped up, or we stumbled, or we, you know, acted stupid, you know. Then we know, because we spent three years with the person, that we could love them back into the kingdom of God, because they would know us, and we would know them. So I don't know about you, but... With Jesus, it took me a little while to really know who he was. It took me some time to really hear him speak to me. And he did audibly. And it took some time for him to grow me up into the man that I've become. And maybe we need to think about that in letting him grow us up and then helping us to grow others up into the people of God that he wants them to be. Because I think that the Prince of Peace came to bring us peace with each other, not just peace with him. That somehow we need to come less to a point of division and strife and more to a place of peace as we see that the end of the world is coming, that Jesus is coming soon. But that we need that peace with each other so that we can share that to a world that has no peace at all. As a matter of fact, as you look at politics and the economy and everything else, most people don't have any peace whatsoever. So shouldn't we be the examples of perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Jesus? Let's focus in on that. You know, let's let's think about that for a while. Practice peace. You know, you can't really practice it. You can just get up early in the morning before everybody gets up and ruins your peace or steals your peace or, you know, somehow robs you of peace. But begin to wind down your caffeine and wind down your coffee. And find a place at some point in time that you can have peace, even when the world is trying to give you no peace. 